this pyramid uh, like like you can uh, uh, see is basically uh, uh, you know the top, top of the line this top of the pyramid is always a systematic uh, 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 reviews meta analysis of randomized uh, uh, double uh, control uh, double blind studies uh, and then this, this of course uh, depends on what kind of meta analysis it is if it's a meta analysis of uh, double blind rcts then it uh, goes on the uh, top of the pyramid and uh, if it is not then it, it comes much much lower and then comes your uh, rcts cohorts case control studies and then case series case reports editorial and then at the bottom of of uh, uh, the pyramid is uh, you know preclinical uh, studies and in vitro research and uh, we have seen a few of these medications as well coming in mainstream uh, of uh, the uh, research and, and uh, unfortunately uh, being touted as uh, the modal treatment or as magic bullets and silver bullets or uh, covid treatment so i will uh, this is from making any controversial statements but uh, so uh, you know the next slide uh, we, we see a lot of this uh, uh, in particularly in the covid uh, times and in this uh, this was one slide which i used to uh, put in uh, a lot of my uh, talks early on one year ago uh, as more of a comment of just than anything else but uh, this this i think uh, most doctors who are here can kind of relate to this when it comes to expert opinion uh, everybody has only when i have one or uh, we have 15 intensivists in uh, cloud physician everybody has anecdotal experiences and uh, 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 you know, uh, expert opinions based on what they have uh, seen or what they have uh, uh, gone through. Uh, but but uh, there is a, a huge fallacy in uh, relying on expert opinion, no matter who the expert is. Uh, in fact, W. H. Palmer, M. D. Uh, was was uh, a very famous physician of, of those times. This is a uh, publication which is more than hundred years old, where he's written a very uh, rather eloquently written paper on um, how intramuscular injections of mercury salicylate uh, treats syphilis and uh, at that point in time this was published in the uh, boston medical and surgical journal which is now the uh, nejm one of the most uh, you know, reputed uh, uh, tier one journals uh, but but when you look at this uh, right now it, it just looks like uh, a lot of focus focus um, but unfortunately you do see a lot of this in mainstream media and social media even uh, intellectual groups at times and it becomes uh, important to look at where really expert opinion and case series case reports and anecdotal reports stand in the evidence pyramid and in pretty much everything that physicians read in harrison or critical care physicians uh, uh, read in uh, any of their textbooks comes out of uh, uh, you know uh, guidelines and treatment modalities which is in the top of the pyramid and there are a lot of uh, uh, stuff which is coming out, uh, which is actually in the bottom of the pyramid and should not really be paid uh, heed to. So I'm just going to look at uh, treatment modalities which have evidence, which have RCTs, double blind control studies, which are at the top of the pyramid and uh, uh, this is from commenting on uh, studies which are at the bottom of the pyramid. The first one, uh, obviously, is the recovery trial. Everybody is very familiar with this one of the earliest trials uh, to come out and uh, very uh, fairly uh, quick, uh, quickly conducted and uh, a very well conducted study, I should say, uh, on uh, uh, steroids where they use 6MG uh, dexamethasone. Uh, the graphs are self-explanatory. You look at the Kaplan graph, the more difference there is between the two lines, uh, the more statistically significant it is. And uh, very obviously, you can see uh, patients who were on uh, invasive mechanical ventilation and patients who were on oxygen did benefit very significant, uh, uh, you know, uh, though statistically significantly from uh, uh, steroids, whereas patients who were not on oxygen actually had a higher mortality. This is something very important. Very often we come across prescriptions almost every single day, uh, including you know, some of our own family members being prescribed steroids for patients who are not on oxygen. And uh, this is something we need to be very, very, very careful about. Uh, particularly, uh, and this mod increase in mortality was in the absence of, uh, you know, super added infection like myocarmycosis. And uh, uh, when we look at Indian data, <coughs> if it uh, uh, are to look at Indian data, they are probably going to be much, much higher uh, because of all the super added infections and poor infection control that we have. 
also steroids uh, this is a collection of all the studies which were done uh, it looked at dexamethasone it looked at methylprednisolone they looked at high dose versus uh, low dose and very evidently you can see in the forest plot here that the largest of course the uh, chunk of the evidence is with the recovery trial there were some other studies which which uh, uh, looked at varying doses and combinations of uh, steroids and uh, 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 bottom line is when when this line crosses the midline there is uh, no uh, benefit and any uh, study which which used a higher uh, dose of steroid actually mm -hmm. had a lower uh, uh, benefit as opposed to the doses which were used in uh, uh, the recovery trial so so far recovery trial has stood the test of uh, whatever little time we have had and uh, it is evident that uh, uh, for uh, uh, covid related lung complications uh, a low dose steroid of uh, 6 mg per day of dexamethasone or e probably equivalent of uh, methylprednisolone is uh, uh, is, is uh, uh, as good or actually better than using a higher dose steroid and uh, uh, probably has a lower met uh, mortality so data so far indicates it's helpful only in patients who have uh, who need oxygen and use of steroids in patients who do not need oxygen may be harmful and could actually increase the chances of someone dying. And smaller trials have not really demonstrated any difference in outcomes when any other steroid is used in uh, place of dexamethasone. And low dose steroids are just as effective or actually probably better compared to a high dose uh, steroid overall. There may be a role for uh, variable dosing, particularly when we look at uh, cryptogenic uh, organizing pneumonia and conditions like that those form a very very small uh, uh, proportion of the patients that we have and uh, uh, the how and why and when is not really clear radiologists can definitely help us at the outset if you see uh, a comment from the radiologist that this is a, cl a clear cut organizing pneumonia there may be a role for slightly higher dose steroid but even those uh, uh, do not exceed uh, 2 mg per uh, kg body weight of uh, steroids is pretty much uh, looking like uh, uh, any dose which is uh, more than 250 uh, milligram uh, is going to be harmful to patients than uh, any kind of benefit. The next drug uh, uh, where I have collated a few papers is of uh, uh, TOSI. Uh, this is uh, uh, one of the uh, earliest earlier trials which, which uh, came out in October uh, where uh, they looked at TOSI as a standard care and uh, a little uh, smaller study didn't show any benefit and a slightly bigger study the Bach trial also looked at uh, TOSI versus uh, placebo and uh, just found a very modest statistically not so significant difference uh, in mechanical ventilation or, or mortality rate worsening. Then there's another uh, Corimino trial which uh, uh, did uh, uh, show that you know patients who uh, were on TOSI few ventilation and uh, uh, this, this was one study favored uh, uh, tocilizumab when, when tosi was used for uh, uh, standard uh, care. However, the most important study amongst all this was uh, uh, probably the Covacta trial, which is done by tocilizumab itself, and uh, they did not find uh, any benefit. And this is very interesting to look at that, you know, the guy who sells Tocilizumab has actually said it. Uh, some this is uh, uh, you know group everything to gain uh, you know uh, fudging data or showing a positive trial. But in the interest, it's uh, uh, quite warming to see that they have not uh, really data. did not show any benefit whatsoever. Impactor study was uh, also a study which uh, I believe had some indirect funding from uh, Roche again. The, the, study uh, looked at a you know a primary outcome of a, a, a progression like progression to a severe disease and uh, that outcome it uh, looked promising however when you uh, dive a little more into the data it becomes very evident that the old uh, did not improve at all whatsoever uh, in the uh, tocilizumab group Rap cap was a large study which was uh, also uh, this this looked at uh, a couple of drugs. It looked at tocilizumab. It also looked at uh, 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 anticoagulation. I'll, I'll comment on that uh, later. Uh, so they did use a ordinal scale analysis and found that there may be some benefit uh, uh, by using tocilizumab. Again, when you look at uh, uh, the data a little more closely, 
uh, one of the most important things, of course, it was a multi-central R RCT. So it is uh, the fidelity and uh, the robustness of the study was pretty good. Uh, but as you can see here, uh, uh, you know, point number five, the low fragility index. Fragility index was just three patients who did not benefit from, from docilizumab. The study would have a negative study. So there were very few patients who received docilizumab. And uh, uh, this was a study of actually a very interesting trivia on all these studies is uh, when you uh, supplementary material and look at uh, how many of them have most of these studies show that the group which received the immunosuppressant had a lower rate of infection as opposed to the placebo group. Uh, so the explanation for that possibly is that uh, patients who uh, were given immunosuppressants had a very very uh, you know higher standard of infection control probably they had they all had one is to one nursing ratio strict uh, you know hand hygiene compliance uh, some of them are in negative pressure rooms uh, so on and so forth now this makes the external validity of uh, uh, you know all these papers very questionable because we even in the best of our ICUs in this country we do not have any of those and we are kind of seeing the fallout of uh, this already so uh, uh, the summary of evidence that it may work in a select group of patients, possibly somebody who is presenting with uh, a very early disease or uh, uh, even a young patient who uh, may, you know, uh, one of the trials did show some mild benefit in patients who had, uh, you know, uh, a second round of worsening uh, somewhere in uh, uh, post uh, first week. Uh, however, uh, uh, the benefit whatsoever has been modest as far as, uh, as, far as all the studies have uh, uh, shown. And uh, this modest benefit, uh, when we look at uh, you know secondary bacterial infections or fungal infections, aspergillus, or uh, is very, very significantly to do more harm. And, and uh, of course, to add uh, uh, the expense that is involved, uh, it, 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 it is something which we as a group do not release in most of the patients and very uh, extremely rarely use it. Uh, Ramdasvir, uh, uh, two major trials, the Solidarity trial and the ACT trial. The Solidarity trial was the largest trial, had you know uh, close to 3,000 patients, was a negative study. The ACT 2 trial, ACT 1 trial, sorry, did show a modest uh, improvement uh, uh, in, uh, uh, you know, to clinical, modest uh, uh, improvement in terms of the number of days to clinical recovery. And uh, uh, however, interestingly, uh, if you actually look at the ACT-1 trial, there was some benefit in patients who did not receive oxygen as well. This trial was done at a time when uh, not many patients who were not on oxygen were receiving uh, uh, remdesivir. Uh, so current uh, uh, thought process is that in patients who are, uh, uh, you know, uh, fall into the moderate category who have severe symptoms but yet not hypoxic, all benefit from remdesivir. However, if a family is not able to procure it for whatsoever reasons, uh, we need to probably, uh, you know, uh, sensitize them and tell them that remdesivir is no magic bullet. And uh, uh, the, while there is some amount of benefit, it, it's not going to, uh, you know, turn around a patient who is already prone ventilated. <clears throat> Another drug which has been uh, looked at uh, with a lot of interest is barcetinib. Uh, now, uh, we need to be a little clear about uh, how and why the study was done and the context in which the study was done. The initial premise was to use barcetinib in patients who had contraindications for steroids or, uh, uh, you know, uh, who were likely to uh, probably have some harm potential because of steroids. So barcetinib was essentially being studied as an alternative to steroid and not as not as an you know, add-on therapy. However, later on, uh, they did a, a, a double-blind RCT on barcetinib where they used barcetinib plus remdesivir and placebo plus remdesivir. Uh, and, and in this group, there were about, uh, uh, I think, close to 200 patients who were also on steroids who had a, a significantly better outcome as compared to uh, either of these groups. So uh, in terms of recarcitinib plus remdesivir had a very moderate, you know, modest benefit and uh, steroid plus remdesivir had um, hands down benefit. Uh, there was a small group of patients in which uh, both remdesivir, barcetinib as well as steroids uh, uh, were given. Uh, but these patients did not show any significant difference in improvement at all. So it looks like, yeah, if you do not have 
uh, the wherewithal or for some uh, reason you're not able to give steroids, uh, then barcetinib may be a, a good add-on therapy to add. But uh, if you can give steroids, that's the way to go. So, uh, yeah. The next next uh, uh, question is, uh, this is rather interesting and uh, has led to a lot of heated debate amongst multiple circles. Cardiology associations have come up with uh, a, a lot of, uh, you know, guidelines. Uh, internally, even in our country, we have a lot of controversial, uh, uh, I mean, conflicting guidelines uh, between states and uh, uh, different organizations, etc. Now, that stems out of a fact uh, that the data itself has been a little conflicting. Uh, however, the largest trials which looked at uh, anticoagulation was the uh, attack active and remap uh, cap RCTs. Now, uh, again, on the outset, when you look at it, it looks like uh, uh, patients who had a severe, uh, a moderate disease did seem to improve slightly more and had more organ support uh, 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 free days in terms of uh, patients who received uh, a therapeutic dose of anticoagulation. Yeah, for clarity, every patient who is uh, in the ICU needs a prophylactic dose of anticoagulation. Everybody needs to be on uh, uh, 40 uh, milligrams of uh, anoxaparin or, uh, you know, heparin or an equivalent dose of fandoparinox or uh, anything else. That is your routine DVT prophylaxis, which we do for all patients, and that definitely has a benefit. We are clearly talking about therapeutic anticoagulation here. Now, when we look at the uh, primary outcome that they studied, that was mainly organ-free support uh, uh, days, uh, where uh, there was a very modest benefit of you know three versus five days uh, with with a, uh, if I remember right, the uh, odds ratio was some point uh, eight seven or something. So that that uh, 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 that being said, when you actually look at the secondary outcomes of this, uh, uh, you know, composite outcomes of all these three studies. But there was absolutely no difference in mortality whatsoever. In fact, there was a slightly statistically insignificant trend towards a higher mortality in patients who received uh, therapeutic anticoagulation. Also, the incidence of uh, uh, significant bleed was also statistically insignificant, but uh, the incidence of bleed was 3.1% in uh, patients who received therapeutic anticoagulation versus 2.4% in patients who did not receive anticoagulation, therapeutic dose. So, uh, so far, uh, when we uh, really, you know, sift through the data, it looks like uh, uh, there is a role for, uh, there is uh, a blanket therapy anticoagulation for all patients is potentially likely to cause a lot more harm uh, than any good, particularly in patients who have mild disease. It is uh, uh, absolutely not beneficial from by the looks of it. Uh, it may be beneficial in a small, small amount of uh, patients who may have a prothrombotic milieu. But uh, when you look at the overall risk uh, that you're exposing patients to, uh, uh, you know, a significant IC bleed, uh, the risk clearly outweighs the benefit uh, whatsoever. And in severe disease, uh, probably a, a practical way to go about it would be the conventional way which uh, we look at, you know, uh, do a D-dimer. If the D-dimer is high, do a DVT scan. And if the DVT screen is positive, then then uh, 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 do an echo and uh, see, look for any stigmata of uh, a pulmonary embolism. And if all this, this is how we conventionally, uh, you know, looked at possibility, uh, kind of evaluated D-dimer. Uh, uh, historically, we never looked at D-dimer in isolation and treated any patient because uh, D-dimer is, is a uh, 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 it's an inflammatory uh, uh, marker. I mean, in the states of inflammation, it can go up on its own. So uh, uh, as per current data, it looks like uh, therapeutic anticoagulation may not be the way to go and is potentially harmful. Next is uh, ivermectin. Uh, there are four studies that I've put here. I'm not going to de in detail uh, each and every one of them. The largest study was uh, 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 the RCT, which was uh, uh, you know, uh, from Colombia which is probably the uh, uh, most robustly conducted study for ivermectin, which was a negative trial. And there were a couple of other double-blind RCTs where uh, no clinical outcomes were studied. This has been the uh, theme with most of these ivermectin studies where nobody has actually ever looked at a clinical outcome and people have just looked at biological clearance and you know what is happening in the Petri dish. So uh, 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 currently, as evidence stands, ivermectin does not look like it has uh, any benefit whatsoever. 
and even in in vitro studies that they did the dose that was recommend used uh, to kind of neutralize covid-19 virus was very very significantly higher than the ones which are you know uh, normally used in uh, uh, clinical uh, uh, use uh, plasma therapy i will not dwell too much on it uh, uh, we have our the largest study which was done was the placid study uh, which was done by our own icmr and it was a negative trial uh, is there a role in select patients it, it it was looking like plasma therapy could be uh, uh, you know it, it's something easy to do it's easily available in, and uh, there are blood blanks everywhere and if it were to be a, a positive trial this is this could have been a, a you know a very uh, useful tool but it doesn't look like it works and there are significant harms with uh, uh, giving any blood products which uh, clearly looks like it is outweighing any benefit uh, that that uh, it can offer so uh, inhaled corticosteroid to reduce severity again uh, this was another open labeled uh, rct which was conducted in the uk a small uh, population 146 patient but uh, did not show any uh, positive outcome so the trial was uh, kind of stopped early colchicine again uh, was studied as a part of the recovery trial where there was absolutely no benefit uh, with uh, uh, administering uh, colchicine so then we also looked at infliximab etolizumab and uh, uh, recently there are a lot of mabs which have uh, come up uh, but so far uh, uh, we uh, don't really have uh, any data to suggest that any of these drugs significantly improve outcomes in uh, any of our patients whatsoever so uh, uh, we kind of need to uh, uh, probably you know uh, tweak uh, how we treat patients a bit and remember that uh, severe ards when i say severe ards those who have a pf ratio of less than 100 they have a baseline mortality rate of uh, you know 20 to 30% even in the best of icus in the world so uh, uh, this is probably uh, one set of patients uh when when we say 30 20% of uh, you know 1000 patient that that's a significant number of patients that you see and that may be pushing uh, a lot of clinicians to kind of try things that they normally wouldn't uh, but we need to understand that uh, it's not this 20% we are targeting but the 80% who will survive with standard care another uh, uh, important area of interest has been uh, uh, use of antibiotics Uh, again there's a lot of uh, the, this this even in routine times antibiotic pressure and the need to uh, want to use antibiotic when somebody is coughing or somebody has fever uh, it, it it's uh, huge and and a lot of our uh, guidelines including the idsa states uh, the use of uh, you know uh, something like levofloxacin or ceftriaxone or uh, uh, azithromycin for community acquired pneumonias however the fact that we do need to remember is most of these guidelines pre covid were set as empirical therapy for community acquired pneumonia and not specific therapy every single guideline which is uh, written in the history of mankind uh, as far as antibiotic therapy is concerned mention that once you have isolated the organism responsible for a particular infection or pneumonia you need to direct your therapy specific to that organism so in covid when a person comes to you with mild to moderate disease we very clearly know that they have a positive rt pcr report and it's a viral disease it's a viral pneumonia and uh, nowadays pretty much everybody gets a ct scan as well so with a good amount of fidelity you can uh, say that this these patients uh, are having a pure viral pneumonia and all of us know that antibiotics do not work against any virus so some facts to consider are uh, that antibiotics do not work against virus and uh, uh, therapy here is not empiric it is specific because you already have a diagnosis and the background rate of secondary bacterial infections even in india i mean uh, those who are physicians here <coughs> can attest to this fact that you know, even through your practice even an anecdotal experience uh, we don't see your uh, routine viral fevers becoming full blown pseudomonas or klebsiella pneumonias uh, except for people who are immunocompromised or old or or uh, or, or have some sort of suppressed immunity for some reason Uh, bacterial pneumonia is almost always start as a bacterial upper respiratory tract infection and then become pneumonia as it's very rare to find a purely uh, you know what or rt to uh, an you know back in bacterial pneumonia in the community this however does happen in a hospital setting but we do need to remember that for a hospital acquired pneumonia to develop it does take a few days it, it no patient is going to present to you with uh, uh, you know hospital acquired pneumonia on day 1 or day 
and CT scans are usually done. And if this is a, a suggestive of only a viral pneumonia, then the use case scenario for an antibiotic becomes moot here as well. And uh, also, I mean, what, uh, one may ask as to, yeah, I want to give a little antibiotic. What's the harm in doing it? Uh, we This is well established. There are guidelines. There are papers. There's enough evidence over the last 30 years to suggest that using antibiotics in any patient who does not need it can harm a patient. So there is no role for prophylactic antibiotics except for certain very specific circumstances. Even those specific circumstances like uh, 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 therapy, in, uh, so prophylaxis in uh, certain, uh, patients who have rheumatic heart disease, etc. Though they are going away from guidelines. So uh, once a patient is in the ICU, however, uh, it can happen, you know, uh, identifying sepsis becomes important. And this is something which we routinely do. We look for, you know, uh, a new onset fever after patients who have uh, that, that I'll address in the next slide. So uh, uh, the identifying a bacterial infection is not that difficult once a patient is in controlled, uh, 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 controlled monitored setting. Now, uh, what what can happen if antibiotics are indiscriminately used? We see a lot of patients who are on uh, meropenem, tigecycline, uh, uh, even things as simple as ceftriaxone right at the outset when they're admitted itself. This uh, holds good both for ward as well as uh, uh, ICU patients. Uh, it, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Antibiotics will kill all bacteria which is sensitive to that particular antibiotic. And all of us, uh, there was a study we had done in Mumbai when I was, I was there where uh, we, we found, uh, uh, you know, gut colonization of, of MDR bacteria in a healthy individual. These were IT professionals and uh, office-going people. So uh, who had MDR bacteria uh, when uh, rectal scrapes were taken. So what happens is if your body has any MDR bacteria lurking here and there, which may not be causing disease simply because the volume of the infection is uh, not that high, you kill all the sensitive bacteria, this uh, multidrug resistant bacteria, uh, uh, you know, start multiplying. So uh, put this in context with COVID, which is already a lymphopenic state. Uh, uh, lymphocytes are like, you know, you know, T lymphocytes are uh, the primary cells, but T lymphocytes are uh, 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 macrophages. And then that whole system of innate immunity is your primary uh, 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 immediate attack mechanism against any uh, uh, infections which, which uh, may come on to you. And these patients are already lymphopenic and some of them may be already receiving steroids and plus viral suppression of general immune response with a background of inflammatory response which is happening and on top of this we hit them with an antibiotic and uh, make them a petri dish which is uh, left with only resistant bacteria it's anybody's guess as to what will happen to these patients so rise of mdr bacteria in one patient also and, and this is not a community level larger uh, grand scheme of things this will affect patients at a very individual level because these patients are going to stay with you for 20 days you give an mdr milieu uh, uh, to one of these patients one week later when they do develop a secondary bacterial infection that is going to be with an mdr bacteria so rise of MDR, MDR bacteria within your ICU puts other patients as well as uh, at risk. And all our gut has a lot of bacteria, which usually doesn't cross and go into the bloodstream. But when a patient is in acute uh, uh, state of uh, shock or infection or inflammation, uh, and then many of them are an NIV and maybe NPO, there's no trophic feeds going on. The gut mucosal mechanism kind of uh, you know shuts off a bit and allows a lot of these uh, uh, bacteria which are MDR bacteria which are left in the gut to translocate in the into the bloodstream. This added to the risk of Clostridium difficile and also antibiotic related specific toxicity. A lot of them are on doxycycline, which which can cause. Uh, we already have seen uh, a few patients with uh, uh, hepatotoxic effects of uh, uh, doxy and. And many, many patients who uh, are on uh, uh, drugs like amikacin coming with nephrotoxicity. And there are uh, a lot of other uh, problems, many other antibiotics as well. And we do know that aspergillus is a problem uh, when particularly when we have immunosuppressed the patient. And galactomannan is one of the modes of, uh, 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 you know, uh, us to know that uh, uh, the patient may have a potential fungal infection. However, antibiotics like piperacil and tazobactam even interferes with uh, a galactomannan assay. Not to uh, mention, of course, the additional financial burden on all these patients. So one may ask, what is a practical approach? I mean, how do I know? I can, cannot, maybe in my patient has not done a CT. So uh, this again, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. We have been dealing with bacterial pneumonias our uh, entire careers. 
we just go to a back to basics approach just remember what we learned in third year of medicine in mbbs uh, one disease explains all the patient symptoms uh, you know diffuse ground glass opacities high swinging fever loss of smell and taste uh, uh, diarrhea for two days hypoxia all this is easily explained by covid 19 and if all the patient symptoms are explained by covid 19 we do not need to fix another diagnosis onto this patients so and also to remember that community acquired MR, mdr pneumonias and mrsas are extremely rare in our sorry and uh, reserve higher antibiotics for later use because a lot of these patients will be in your ICU for weeks. Some of them will develop hospital-acquired pneumonias. At this point in time, you will need to reserve your peptides and you know meropenem and other medications for uh, those times rather than using it uh, right in the beginning and then ending up with a, a situation where you have only cholestin left in your hand to use on these patients. And we all know cholestin is not, not a very uh, strong bactericidal agent. It just works against a wide variety of you know uh, organisms. And uh, also to remember that severe ARDS, it doesn't matter how severely sick the patient is. If viral pneumonia is explaining the patient's condition, even severe ARDS with a patient who has a saturation of even 60 on an 80% of FIO2 does not warrant antibiotic use. So uh, how do we uh, actually say, OK, someone is actually developing a bacterial pneumonia? Conventional wisdom, you know, uh, what, what has been described in medicine throughout our uh, uh, you know, educational and uh, uh, career, education and career. That's uh, look for yellow or green colored sputum. Look for low bar pneumonia on the initial CT. Is the patient developing a new consolidation on X-ray or ultrasound? A serially, serially increasing uh, procalcitonin. Is the patient developing a uh, you know fresh fever spike in the second week of illness? Is the patient getting hypotension? And uh, I cannot stress enough the importance of culturing, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, patients. Uh, so it could be sputum culture, it could be cultures from blood, it could be cultures from the lines that you have put in. Uh, this, these will, uh, these have helped us diagnose bacterial infections for decades. And COVID is not any different. Even secondary bacterial infections in COVID also can get diagnosed with the same modalities that we used to always historically use. So uh, yeah, this is just a small disclaimer stating uh, uh, everything is based on high uh, quality index publications. But if there is any conflicting data out there in the uh, public domain that I'm not aware, that's uh, 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 you know uh, something I'd, I'd, uh, I'm not aware of. And uh, the intellectual contents are not proprietary to me or Cloud Physician. And if there is any misrepresentation, uh, that is. Uh, uh, we do not assume responsibility for that. So I, I open the floor for questions. Uh, uh, me, uh, 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 Dilip, Dhruv, and Shashi will take the questions. Uh, there's a question about a specific condition in which tocilizumab can be used. Uh, you want to take that, Dilip? Yeah, so if the patient meets the exact trial criteria, which is a CRP of more than 75 and evidence of hypoxic respiratory failure, that is a reasonable indication to use tocilizumab. Uh, and in, in the right setting, meaning if you have all the other additional uh, points like the appropriate care setting in which tocilizumab was used, if that can be replicated, then that's a good reason to, to use tocilizumab. Now, those specific criteria are not always met and we have seen it being prescribed. So we do not know if that is the correct way to do it. And given the shortage that we already have, uh, that, that point is essentially moot because you don't have the drug freely available. That said, if I have a patient who is meeting the inclusion criteria of the trial, um, it, it is an appropriate drug to give as an adjunct to steroids when the steroids are dosed at the same dose range that was done at the, in, in the original trial, which is 6 milligrams 
equivalent of dexamethasone. So what, what I think is irrational is when we are using 12 to 18 milligram doses of dexamethasone and then putting another additional immunosuppression with tocilizumab or any other agent for that matter on top of that. Another common question is uh, generally about um, uh, the use of steroids, the dose of steroids, and the duration of steroids. Uh, Dilipo, anyone wants to comment about it? Uh, yeah, so it, it's related to the tocilizumab question itself. Thanks, Shashi. So the point here is that um, we, we don't know enough about the disease, but what we do know is that some components of the disease may be steroid responsive and that has to do with certain phenotypes so if you look at the original meduri study uh, on ARDS um, the meduri protocol has used one to two milligrams of methylprednisolone for the first seven to ten days uh, and then a tapering schedule after that uh, over a period of 28 days and that was a, a basket collection of all ARDS cases with all types of histopathologies uh, in that group uh, one of the patho pathological patterns noted in COVID is the organizing pneumonia pattern. And that organizing pneumonia is a specific subtype called the AFOP or the acute fibrinous organizing pneumonia pattern. What we do know is that organizing pneumonia uh, is exquisitely steroid sensitive. So typically in five to seven days, you do see a beneficial uh, response to steroids in the dose range of 0.5 to 1 milligram of uh, methylprednisolone equivalent. So Combining these two uh, sets of both historic uh, data and, and um, going in accordance with how viral pneumonias behave, I think once the acute viremia phase has resolved, if the patient is in this uh, steroid responsive cohort, they are likely to derive benefit. And the dose of steroids probably should be titrated according to some of these established protocols. So either an organizing pneumonia dose or maybe a Meduri protocol dose in that range. We have never tested steroids at a higher dose than that extensively in ARDS, such as in doses of 250 a day or you know, even 1,000 a day. Uh, this is not an autoimmune vasculitis uh, that, that we use these doses and even combine them with immunosuppressives such as cyclophosphamide. That data simply isn't there. Whatever data is there for the dose of 125 to 250 is in very small studies, less than 30 patient to 100 patient studies, and they are uh, bias studies without appropriate blinding or randomization. So the evidence that exists, exists in the ARDS space and the organizing pneumonia space. And the doses for those two conditions that have closest parallels with um, the COVID-19 type pneumonia is in the 0.5 to uh, 1 to 1 1.5 range uh, dose. So all we can do when we don't have good data is to look at historic data that comes close to what you're dealing with. And that suggests that this is an appropriate and safe dose. Uh, so the most important thing here is to avoid giving steroids too early because we do know from H1N1 data that if you use uh, steroids in active viral pneumonias too early, there may be a harm signal. And that harm signal was also seen in the recovery trial. So there is no pressing need at this point in time to start it too early. You want to wait for the five to seven day period to lapse then the patients start falling into the uh, Meduri trial bucket and also uh, in, into, uh, you know, like a post-viral organizing pneumonia bucket. And you're safer at that point to use steroids. We have a question on 2-deoxy-D glucose. Uh, yeah, well, well, let me take that. Uh, so uh, uh, enough said that uh, I have been trying to uh, uh, search through all sorts of uh, you know publication resources over the last few days, and I'm yet to find uh, uh, one trial uh, where this drug has been studied outside that of uh, animal models. So the current data does not warrant uh, uh, you know us to endorse this drug uh, in our practice at least. So historically, this is a, a more than a 50-year-old drug, which is uh, basically, uh, uh, you know, uh, studied as a drug which is to be used for cancer. It's a cytotoxic therapy. 
uh, and and we do not have any data currently at least in the public domain uh, at least uh, at least in the public domain which which uh, supports the use of uh, 2-deoxy uh, D-glucose and uh, uh, there aren't enough uh, robust trials uh, done even on the safety profile of this drug uh, even pre-COVID uh, so uh, uh, currently I, I would not personally endorse this drug and uh, uh, if, if more data uh, would come out uh, in the public domain, we are free to, you know, we are happy to change our uh, uh, view on this. Any yeah so uh, let me just uh, dr rasika she has a question on uh, steroids so let me just just uh, go back to my uh, initial uh, slides one of my initial slides sorry so uh, uh, this this slide kind of answers your question dr rasika i mean if uh, uh, you look at uh, uh, the graphs you can clearly see that patients who were on invasive mechanical ventilation and patients who were on oxygen benefited. That is, the, the mortality rate kind of uh, reduced a bit. However, patients who were not on oxygen when steroids were given, more number of patients died. So actually, there is a harm potential with using steroids in patients who are not on oxygen and explicitly should not be used. And uh, even further trials do not uh, demonstrate any data to state otherwise. So uh, in uh, a patient who does not have hypoxia, steroids uh, explicitly should not be used. So one of the things that we can discuss is that when will you use steroids if there is no hypoxia? Maybe right. that's a question worth asking. So I would say that, you know, before before uh, COVID, when people had organizing pneumonia and we thought it's due to a viral trigger, by the time the patients come to us, it's usually maybe 15 to 20 days after the acute trigger for organizing pneumonia uh, in, in a typical pulmonology clinic. So what you can think of is that if you think that the patient is past the acute viremia phase, and this is a post-viral organizing pneumonia two, three weeks down the line, and they're symptomatic, they're coughing, they're short, short of breath, you can treat them like an organizing pneumonia at that point. And low-dose steroids is fine for that. Now, the, the problem that we are facing is giving it too early. And that is what the data strongly suggests that we don't do. We still have. I think Dr. Basant was maybe asking a question. Um, it, maybe the order didn't come through. Hello. Yes, Dr. Basant, go ahead. Yeah. Why well, there is more case of mucormycosis in second wave than first wave as compared to first wave? Yeah. So uh, uh, this is uh, uh, you know. It's actually been around even in the first wave. Uh, we we had a lot of reports from uh, uh, Mumbai and Pune and uh, a lot of other places where uh, a case series of mucormycosis were being reported uh, in, in actually significant numbers. Uh, but it's just that uh, uh, this the current mucormycosis cohort that we're getting uh, is potentially not just patients who uh, received steroids uh, in the second wave. They, they potentially could be patients who received it in the first wave as well. And uh, But that being said, the uh, overall number of cases is significantly higher this time around. And uh, uh, the availability of drugs, the availability of uh, uh, immunosuppressant drugs are also significantly gone up. So mucormycosis risk factor is pretty much a you know, triad of uh, uh, an immunosuppressed state, uh, uh, a vulnerable host, as well as uncontrolled sugars. So uh, uh, any uh, milieu in which uh, these three exist, mucormycosis is a risk factor in our uh, country. We have it everywhere. We have uh, each one of us in this uh, you know, talk has it already in our nostrils. It's just that it doesn't cause infection unless uh, there is an immunosuppressed state and uncontrolled sugars. So we're just seeing more volumes of it. It was always there in the background, 
but the volumes have increased potentially possibly because the availability of immunosuppressant drugs have become more than last years and also the use of them has also significantly gone up uh, this coupled with uh, uh, the number of cases also being very very significantly higher and uh, in addition to that we have a much younger population likely to self medicate and uh, uh, also the use of pulse steroids uh, have been very widely discussed and being uh, uh, you know used so uh, uh, sometimes it does happen that uh, post viremic uh, immunosuppressive uh, state can go on for a while this coupled with uh, you know highly uncontrolled sugars can actually fester mucor for a while and then the patient may uh, kind of uh, present uh, hope that answers your question uh, dr basan okay yeah okay uh, dilip there's one more question about um, uh, anti fibrotic therapy and uh, if you can think about anti fibrotic therapy is it something we need to use and at what stage and if so early use of anti fibrotic therapy is it um, yeah this is this is a good question because this has come up many times and the anti fibrotics currently in the market include perfenidone and nintetinib perfenidone and nintetinib are drugs that have been tried and tested for um, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and we have a fairly good data set set on how they work but the problem with these two drugs is that they are not particularly efficacious uh, in even in ipf their their benefits on the forced lung capacity forced vital capacity is fairly marginal after taking the drug for a duration of 1 year so to put that in perspective as an anti fibrotic agent early in the course of ards steroids are far more potent than these two drugs and once the initial inflammation has subsided the um, lung essentially starts to behave like a static fibrotic lung disease not a rapidly progressive lung disease like idiopathic uh, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis so the question is how early can we start with the first question before how early should be why should we start is there a good reason to start anti fibrotics and at this point in time there is no good evidence um, to make that case so parallels would be we have never been routinely using it in ards we don't use it in post tp fibrosis these are all static lung diseases these are all lung diseases that the fibrosis happens during the period of acute inflammation and then subsides and then it's a fixed defect so until we have a good reason to do that as a standard practice we don't know if there's any benefit at all whatsoever and anti fibrotics have a risk of um, liver damage they have side effects they're not completely benign drugs and just from a ipf experience we think it's highly unlikely to be uh, as efficacious as as it's theoretically believed to be so we do see prescriptions of this um, every now and then but the magnitude of benefit is just not there and like i was saying the the amount of benefit you get from steroids early on is likely to be far more than these drugs that have only very minimal effects even in the best case uh, scenarios so we're not routinely using them or advocating for their use yeah there is a diff, uh, another question from dr mukta about uh, does management of covid differ in any way in pregnant women with covid uh, particularly in the context of anticoagulant so uh, uh, as far as pregnant women are concerned there's no major difference in terms of uh, management of uh, uh, covid in pregnant women we uh, kind of manage them uh, similarly one one of a thing of course we would uh, do far less uh, number of cts or uh, try and avoid ct scans if they are in the first trimester that is uh, one difference i can think of and with respect to anticoagulants uh, uh, his all anticoagulants are generally considered non teratogenic particularly the widest amount of uh, evidence we have in terms of anticoagulation is for enoxaparin and heparin uh, heparin of course has been around for way longer than uh, enoxaparin so if if given a choice as to which one to use i would use heparin but that being said uh, we we would not uh, you know use an anticoagulant unless it is really warranted we know pregnancy is a prothrombotic state but uh, unless uh, it is a life saving therapy the risk to the baby uh, particularly in uh, lactation is not very very clear and uh, if it's going to save somebody's life we already have a demonstrated dvt uh, the answer i think i think a straight answer to that is Uh, i would be more uh, diligent in uh, uh, 
uh, uh, investigating a case uh, when a patient is pregnant and make sure that this patient needs anticoagulation and if he absolutely if she absolutely needs anticoagulation then i would probably use heparin or anoxaparin would be a little wary with uh, all the noax and uh, rivaroxaban and all that we we don't have that much of data yet uh, uh, any other comments on that uh, shashi uh, the lip not really the uh, anoxaparin with the uh, choice only because it does not cross, cross the placenta very easily just like in, a non, uh, in any other time whether it's covid or not I think uh, we've, we've covered most of the important uh, topics here. Any any further questions or comments uh, before we close? All right. Uh, thank, thank you, everyone. I think it was a very engaging discussion. Thanks for being part of this. Oh, wait. We have one there more is, question. Uh, yeah. Oh, we have one? Okay. Thanks. One question. Duration of treatment. Uh... OK. OK, the question. OK. So now we don't take that answer. Yeah. So uh, again, like like I addressed earlier in my talk, uh, D-dimer is a very, very, uh, uh, you know, it, it is like your total. Uh, it's actually not as bad as your total count. But uh, it is something like CRP or albumin, which is a negative acute phase reactant. So it is also an acute phase reactant which can go up in multiple states, including trauma, pregnancy, uh, uh, routine viral fevers, etc. So D-dimer alone in isolation is not probably the right tool to use to decide on an anticoagulant. Uh, so uh, how we go about it is, if I need to take D-dimer uh, uh, as, as a valid tool of screening, we need to have a high pretest probability. That is, uh, the probability of this patient having a DVT or a pulmonary embolism needs to be high before I take D-dimer as a tool for, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, to tell me whether I can use an anticoagulant or not. So if, if a patient has a high D-dimer, I would look if the patient, uh, if it's a pregnant lady who's just undergone a pelvic surgery or if uh, uh, she has uh, uh, some stigmata of hypoxia, which is unexplained, uh, you know, when I look at uh, the clinical condition, you have a clean X-ray or clean CT, uh, and still the patient is hypoxic. Then we do a DVT scan, we do a Doppler, and look for any uh, uh, DVT. And if we do find a DVT, then we scan, screen the heart and see if there is any RARV strain pattern. And uh, of course, this coupled with an ECG and multiple other markers, and, and if all these are positive, then I would say, okay, the D-dimer is positively uh, ele elevated, and this patient uh, elevated because of a thrombotic load in the lung, and this possibly needs an anticoagulant, and that would be the context in which I would, uh, uh, you know, uh, use D-dimer as a tool in pregnancy or otherwise. Uh, so the answer is yes. I mean, uh, we investigate based on D-dimer, but we do not treat based on D-dimer. Yeah, and, and most of the organizations are, are supporting this stance. D-dimer by itself is not the sole indication to start anticoagulant. And your question was exactly that, that many are using D-dimer alone as a sole marker for anticoagulation. That, that's not, not based on any, um, you know, that's just based on a reductionist argument where, you know, you're thinking that this, just because D-dimer is high, lowering the D-dimer as a marker will reduce the uh, incidence of thrombosis. It doesn't work that way, especially in critical care. We know we have multiple trials that show that, for example, in the ARDSnet study, when we studied low tidal volume ventilation, the other group with high tidal volume ventilation actually had higher oxygen levels, which we think would have been a better marker of outcome. But the people who have high oxygen and high tidal volumes actually did worse than the low tidal volume group. So these are all surrogate markers and can be red herrings. What you want is hard endpoints. And D-dimer is not a hard endpoint. Um, and and that's that's where the fallacy lies. It also includes the dose of, I mean, the value of the D-dimer and the dose of anticoagulation. We still, if, if there's an indication for prophylactic anticoagulation, you give only prophylactic and not based upon a uh, very high value of D-dimer, and hence we need to give a um, therapeutic um, dose of anticoagulation. 
that's right and d dimer values are also not standardized there are at least four different varieties of the test with five diff five or six different generations of the test which uh, makes it even harder to quantify understand and correlate d dimer with uh, with what we do i think it's 6:01 yeah. pm and the discussion has been very engaging so thanks thanks everyone yeah. for actually yeah. dropping by thanks everyone if, if there are any further questions uh, feel free to uh, uh yeah there's one more comment dr rashmi has made I'd like to share our experience in the icu that etolism app had a good outcome dr rashmi you can uh, yeah please share uh, your experience that is good i think she just wanted to text i'm not sure ma'am you can unmute your mic and speak. yeah hello am i audible yes yes, yes you yes. are uh, yeah yeah actually uh, we had uh, some of the etolism app in our icu so initially we used uh, like uh, for about uh, 10 patients in our icu we had very good results so we we like uh, when we wanted to start etolizumab, we actually took patients who had IL-6 more than 50 and severe ARDS. So by the end of third day, their IL-6 used to come to less than 5. So we used to repeat interleukin-6 after three days. So what we felt was etolizumab had better outcome than tocilizumab because we didn't try much with the tocilizumab but etolizumab uh, for sure like we had very good results and even mortality was very less icu stay was very less we were happy with the etolizumab yeah thanks thanks for sharing that uh, uh, dr rashmi uh, so uh, uh, etolizumab uh, yeah, I mean, uh, there have been anecdotal evidence that it works uh, just as well or, uh, you know, uh, better than TOC intermittently. Uh, but, uh, uh, I mean, all I can say is anecdotal experience is anecdotal experience and uh, we need to uh, probably uh, wait for more data on this. Uh, and having, uh, uh, you know, uh, spoken about the infection risk that we have, uh, it, it's, it's uh, something we need to wait and watch if, if we can use this at a large scale. There's always confounders uh, 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 involved that, that maybe they have also received steroids along with it. Maybe this was one cohort who may have benefited from uh, uh, monoclonal antibodies. Uh, so, uh, I mean, it would be difficult to comment on that at this point in time, but, but uh, thank, thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Rashmi, for sharing that. I think uh, uh, we'll break. Uh, any other questions, feel, please feel free to uh, you know uh, send any one of us a message or a mail and we'll revert to you. Thank you, one and all, for the yeah. discussion. Bye. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Shashi, Philippe, and Sano for uh, conducting this. And uh, thank you, everyone, for attending. We will we'll keep everybody posted on uh, any future uh, such webinars. We we hope to and we intend to have uh, conduct these on a periodic basis and um, we will keep you all informed uh, and thank you for your active participation.